This week, we welcome Brian Reed, cybersecurity evangelist from Proofpoint, to discuss the human element of security awareness. In the leadership and communication section, how to strive and thrive in a meeting, five steps toward real zero trust security, seven strategies for building a great security team, and more. Business Security Weekly starts now. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we explore the business of security to improve the security of business. Your trusted source for actionable insights on leadership, communication, and innovation. Get ready for Business Security Weekly. We're proud to announce CISO Stories, a new podcast series in partnership with Cybersecurity Collaborative and Cyber Reason. CISO Stories features the candid perspectives and experiences of frontline senior security executives and dives deep into timely security topics. CISO Stories is hosted by Todd Fitzgerald, VP of Cybersecurity Strategy at Cybersecurity Collaborative, and Sam Curry, Chief Product and Security Officer at Cyber Reason. Listen weekly as they speak with extraordinary CISOs by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash CSP. Let's face it, cyber attackers have the advantage. Extra Hop is on a mission to help you take it back. Regain the upper hand with security that can't be undermined, outsmarted, or compromised. When you don't have to choose between protecting your business and moving it forward, that's security uncompromised. See how it works in the full product demo, free online at securityweekly.com forward slash extra hop. Every 11 seconds, there's a new ransomware attack. Oil pipelines, universities, corporations, all paying millions of dollars. Barracuda says, don't pay the ransom. Before a ransomware attack occurs, train your teams to recognize an attack and use anti-phishing technology. Protect your applications and they can't get onto your network. Simple backup and restore solutions quickly recover your data without paying the ransom. Build your ransomware protection plan now by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash Barracuda. That's securityweekly.com forward slash Barracuda. Welcome to Business Security Weekly. This is episode number 235, recorded October 11th, 2021. I am your host, Matt Alderman, here in a chilly Colorado. Joining me remotely are my co-hosts. First, Mr. Ben Carr in Texas, buddy. Hey, Matt. How's it going? Yep, it's starting to uh, cool down here as well. Not quite as much as Colorado, but uh, yeah, enjoying the change in the weather. Yeah, I had to shut down all the sprinklers this weekend because now it's below freezing, which means it's time to shut them down before I burst a line. Also joining me, is filling in for Jason Albuquerque today, is Mr. Lee Neely. I bet it's getting cold in Idaho too, buddy. Oh, yeah, we're getting there. The uh, It's supposed to hit below freezing starting tonight. Uh, we're getting that close. We're this close to turning off the pressurized irrigation system for the season. I'm still getting used to that. The old sprinkler blowout, turn off the turn off the water six months out of the year. Kind of cool, kind of different. And uh, we're looking forward. We're feeling the change of season. It's basically 40 degrees right now. Snow in the forecast for tomorrow. So yes. it, it, it's it's yes. actually kind of late for us. Sometimes we get it in late September, but it'll be October 12th, probably for our first snowfall. Don't miss any of your favorite Security Weekly content. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to any of our podcast feeds and have all our new episodes downloaded right to your phones. You can also join our mailing list, Discord server, and follow us on social media and our streaming platforms. Join us October 21st to learn why zero knowledge Zero knowledge encryption matters. I was going down a zero trust path. That's zero knowledge encryption matters. If you miss any of our previously recorded webcasts or technical trainings, they are available for your viewing pleasure at securityweekly.com forward slash on demand. This segment is sponsored by Proofpoint. To learn more, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash Proofpoint. Brian Reed is cybersecurity evangelist at Proofpoint. He comes to Proofpoint from Gartner, where he focused on a wide variety of topics, cloud security, data security, incident response, insider threats, and security awareness. Since 2015, he published over 50 thought-leading research notes at Gartner, including cool vendors reports, market guides for digital forensics and incident response services, and security awareness training, 
risk management research, as well as the last two Gartner Magic Quadrants for Enterprise DLP. Brian, welcome to Business Security Weekly. Great. Thank you. Thanks for having me and uh, super excited to be here. We're not going to talk DLP today. We're going to talk security awareness, even though I, I, I could have you on for a second DLP segment. because Bl- bless, bless you. Bless all of you <laughs> for not talking about DLP. <laughs> all right. So you and I feel the same way about DLP. Then. Okay, good. <laughs> I, I'm, the, I'm the guy who retired the DLP magic quadrant at Gartner. How do you think I really feel about it? Exactly right. So let's talk security awareness. It's October. It's Cybersecurity Awareness Month. We've talked about this topic on various shows across Security Weekly. We've talked about it here on Business Security Weekly. I think one of the, you know, we know it's important, but yet we see so many phishing attacks succeed. And it to me, it's more of a a safety versus security thing. We were talking before the segment a little bit about my experience. When I went through awareness training, like when I was in nuclear power or oil and gas, those things stuck because it was about personal safety. And, and I'm curious, have, have we made any improvements from a security awareness perspective or are we just still kind of spinning our wheels a bit? Yeah, I, I think the biggest problem I have with the term security awareness is security awareness. And a lot of what you mentioned in the intro about clicking on links and phishing, I, to me, that that's like a subsection of the problem. It, in my mind, and, and we've done a lot of uh, events and things like that in 2021 here at Gartner around the, or, or, sorry, at the, uh, man, PTSD slip there, uh, at Proofpoint around security culture. It's about building a culture is ultimately what you want to do. If if your security awareness program involves getting excited about sending don't click on links emails in October, you're doing it wrong. Exactly right, right? We spend this whole month (laughs) and all we do is we do exactly that. Like we should call it cybersecurity culture month. Like how do you build a good cybersecurity culture? Because at the end of the day, if you have a really good cybersecurity culture, then what people start to realize is that it's 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 about the individual it's about protecting the individual but also the organization and i think yeah. we appreciate it or we take it a little more personally than just this this one off kind of training thing yeah and you're exactly right it's about making it personal but making it relevant right it's got to be things that you can relate to and that are relatable to you and and it's not just about the consequence side of it which you mentioned uh before we jumped on we started talking a lot about consequences particularly in a lot of those uh industrial segments and government uh organizations and things like that where uh if you do mishandle data you do mishandle a message it's potentially a life or death situation we don't have that for the vast majority of businesses out there uh, and for-profit organizations out there. But the reality is that that doesn't mean that the, there's not a, a potential for peril or that there's not damages. Uh, if you do click on something, you do mishandle something, you do overshare something with, with somebody you think you're talking to, but you're really not. So it's it's really about understanding what what are the consequences. Yes, consequences are important, but what, you know, do I know what I'm supposed to be doing? Do I know, you know, the boundaries of how I'm supposed to be doing, you know, the things I do day in and day out? You know, we sign up a new business partner. Hey, that's great. We've got new business coming in the door. What what does that look like when we first share information with them? You know, what what sort of rights and privileges are we giving them to, you know, hey, welcome on board to being our partner at Acme Corp. Here's a bunch of information for you. You know, are are we screwing up at the onset by you know not having some of those cultural, you know, foundations in place? Well, I think it doesn't, can you say that you think it tracks back to the motivation for it? I mean, if we really think about why we're doing things and how we're incentivizing people, I mean, I think that's been one of the the fallacies and problems for information security across the board, right, is, is many times people are doing things for a compliance reason. And if you do something for a compliance reason, you're just really trying to check that box, right? And so, you know, if you think phishing attempts or, you know, security awareness programs, it's that typical, we do end of year, we do it during security awareness month, but it's not a, it's not a holistic way to address the issue of actually trying to get out awareness. It's let's check the box. And when that's done, nobody likes doing it, right? 
Yeah. And, and it's going to sound really funny coming from somebody who now gets a paycheck from Proofpoint to say, uh, you know, don't click on the links that it, it's all about that. But if we think about, you know, particularly in the world that we live in around the modern workforce, and what we all went through the last 18 months, you know, think about when a document gets updated in your Office 365 tenant, what happens? Well, an email gets generated with, guess what? A link in it. What are you supposed to do? Not click on the link when you know, you're supposed to be getting your job done by updating an Excel spreadsheet or something like that. So just coming in and having this draconian security awareness uh, program of don't click on links, all links are bad. That's not the right answer. There's a lot of supporting technology. There's a lot of things we can do to get people to understand what does a good link look like? What does a bad link look like? Uh, there's supporting technology, like I said, that we can uh, interject into there. Do we want um, particularly people that are in high risk roles or who tend to open up a lot of shared documents? Do we want to uh, have them you know, opening those in a browser isolated session or some other enhanced web security on top of that? Those are, those are all excellent countermeasures to put in place. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about security culture, I know I, I had a customer I spoke with in my past life as an analyst, and one of the things that they were getting a lot of pushback, and I see this a lot here at Proofpoint, is you know, my executives don't want all these additional security controls. They don't want yet another endpoint. They don't want a browser plug in. But one of the ways that I've seen around this problem is treat them like, you know, VIPs, treat them like uh, royalty, you know, have sort of a boutique security program that that you almost market and sell and build around them. You know, hey, Mr. COO, hey, Mr. COO, hey, head of my business unit, you're so important that we want to push down browser isolation to you. You're so important that we're going to isolate some of the, the, the web activity you have because we want to protect you. Because it's not just about the company, we want to protect you and your brand. Now isn't we're that talking not back about to friction though, right? I mean, isn't it about making sure that the friction so for every user is really you know something we're addressing from a security perspective and thinking about that, not just saying, hey, let's let's put another gate yeah, in front of somebody, but let's lower the friction. Yeah, it's it's really about, you know, again, getting users to feel like you're building a boutique security program for them, regardless of sort of where they're at. I use the example of executives, but it could really be applied to anybody of you know, one of the things that that comes up a lot in security awareness is talking about this notion of uh, you know, gamification of having things like leaderboards up and how are, how am I doing against my peer group and things like that? It, it's another thing to basically say, Hey, look, we're going to, we're going to add in some of these additional controls because of, you know, you seeing this, or maybe Brian's really good at identifying phishing emails, but somebody else is really bad at, at recognizing what a uh, malicious form looks like through email. So I react to that particular event because partly because I work at a, a, a federally funded research and development agency. And when you start tracking trends like that, you will wind up into human subject testing, which requires explicit approvals and oversight. Believe it or not, we used to track our uh, some of that, some of those metrics, and we were shut down because we were doing human subject monitoring and testing, um, which I thought was interesting. Uh, so you have to watch your regulatory requirements, but I think anything you can do to raise the bar, I love those ideas. I mean, we had a friend, real smart guy, told told my wife once he was in this new company taking their cyber training. He was there seven years before he realized it actually was relevant to what he did. That's, I think, a fail on the training side uh, or or the relevant side that you mentioned earlier. Um, and I, and I, so I'm very interested in what we can do to fix that. I mean, that seemed crazy at taking seven years for it to be relevant to somebody. Yeah, there's certainly a lot that we can do from the training side. So the days of having these sort of stale computer-based training modules or, hey, it's welcome to October 1st. All of a sudden, you've got a bunch of mindless CBTs uh, to click next, next, finish on, kind of like we all did with uh, install shield scripted software in the 1990s. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just, it, that's not helpful. Uh, what is helpful is what can we do uh, with some newer ways to approach the technology problem? Can we make it job role relevant? Can we do things like nano learning and micro learning and give people bite size uh, segments of learning? Or can we you know, go back to your phishing example, go back to the malicious form over email. Uh, when somebody clicks on that form, could I have a plug-in in their email browser that pops up in a, in a just-in-time fashion and says, hey, do you actually realize what you just clicked on? 
Uh, one of the, I, I think one of the best security awareness tips, and I'm probably going to catch a lot of flack for saying this, is a lot of the tool tips that were added in several years ago to Office 365. Just giving people a notion of, hey, do you realize you just attached a Excel document with PII in it? And, and you don't have to violate anybody's privacy per se to, to, to do that or point that out. But it's just sometimes some of those low barrier common sense things that are relevant to how somebody's doing their job, you know, end up ringing true and means so much. Yeah, and you were bring as you were Clippy. talking through, you were yeah, bring back Clippy. <laughs> as you were explaining the executive example, right? You made it personal. You made it personal to the executive, right? So that they started to understand and appreciate it more from a personal perspective, not just an organizational perspective. Yeah. Are there other ways to create that personal motivation for the employee. You know, now that we're all at home, online, doing a lot of uh, activities, you got your kids at, at home as well. I mean, there's a lot of opportunities. I don't know that we capitalize yeah. on them to teach people about more personal safety in these environments that then transcends into the work environment. Yeah, I would agree. I, I think a big opportunity here, this, this is both an opportunity and a potential pitfall at the same time, is interjecting comedy and humor into training. Uh, and, and this is one that you really have to understand your organization's culture, which let's face it, as security people, of, of which I've been for two decades plus, um, security people and IT people are kind of notoriously bad for speaking the language of the business. Uh, we just are uh, as hard as we try to not be. But you, the opportunity for humor there is one where, just as you mentioned, hey, I've got my dog going nuts. Uh, it's funny, right before we went live, I had the Amazon Prime truck in front of my house. And my dog loves the Prime driver, not because of the you know, brightly colored van, but because the, the driver brings my dog dog biscuits with packages. So it's, it's almost like a Pavlovian uh, reflex that, uh, oh, the Amazon Prime truck's here, it's, it's dog biscuit time. Yeah, I, But if, I we can, if we can make humor relevant, things like, things like you mentioned, like, hey, dogs barking at home, kids pulling on my leg to do homework, how can we interject those into part of the training to help? You know, first of all, the, the first barrier to any sort of training before you teach people, you've got to let people know that you relate to them. That, that you're on the level with them, that, that you, you understand where they're coming from and you understand where they're coming from, that mutual empathy. If that mutual empathy is not there, you're not going to teach anybody anything. Yeah, I, I think the humor is a great point that you hit on. Uh, you know, I implemented a program that used just that, used humor in kind of this regular frequency. And I have to say, it was the most positively accepted security awareness program I've ever engaged with, right? I actually had people coming up, stopping me in the halls and saying, hey, I can't wait to see the next episode, right? And, and they enjoyed the humor. And I think that, to your point, engaged on a much more personal level. And I think yeah. that's one of the things in you know, cyber that we need to figure out how to do more of is engage personally, right? And turn this into a human issue, not a technical problem that we're trying to solve. Because at the at the end of the day, that human thing is much more difficult, but it gives us much more bang for the buck as a result. Yeah, and, and even I, I love the human relation part of this because th the humor part, going back to humor, this is an area that, like I said, it, it can be uh, both a really good thing, but it can backfire on you. Th this is something where you really have to understand your own organizational culture. Um, we certainly don't want to make uh, you know, comments that would that would you know gender and and things like that 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 would be you know expositing uh, biases or prejudices in any way. Uh, that's not humor. Uh, what is humor is something that is universally accepted uh, as something that can be funny. Um, I mean, even making a joke out of your own IT department <laughs> or your own uh, past in information security. Uh, are, those are those are good candidates where you can point at you know sort of uh, universal truths as opposed to uh, you know going down the, the the dark side of humor into what ultimately is not humor. Um, it's something that you've got to be really careful. You've got to you've got to really understand your audience, and and it's a tough thing to do to be successful at it. But to your point, when you are successful at it, the results are pretty pretty self evident and obvious. The, the other challenge, I think, is making it personal from a safety perspective. We, were, we talked a little bit about this already. Humor sometimes can't really help identify like the, the consequences, like what could really happen sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. 
if my bank account gets hacked and somebody takes all my money, right? That's a really, really bad thing. Humor can't always bring some of that kind of personal safety, like the consequences side of it around. As I was describing before, I worked in nuclear power and oil and gas. And and when you're dealing with life-threatening things like radiation and and very toxic chemicals as part of byproducts that in the like in the refining process, you remember those because they stick with you like it's life or death. Humor can't always do that. And I'm not saying that security awareness is about life and death, but we have seen some recent articles around ransomware attacks, shutting down systems in hospitals, for example, that can create some you know, life-threatening events. Not that every industry faces that. So if you can't use humor to bring some of that personal like safety into the mix, are there other approaches we should really be thinking about to make it stick? Yeah, I, I think there, there's a number of different things that we can do. Again, it, it all starts in rooted back to being relatable to the organization you're in. I, I think one of the areas that's going to be most interesting as we start seeing things open up, and we saw some of this in the summer, uh, particularly in global organizations that started having people return to site and return to offices. Uh, it, it, for those of us who might not remember two years ago and earlier, a big part of our security awareness was around things like site safety and physical security, uh, things like, you know, don't let people follow you in, you know, when you badge yourself into the door, you know, clean desk strategies, those sorts of things. Uh I, I think we're going to need to start thinking as, as you know, optimistically knock on knock on wood, knock on anything that we're going to start moving uh, back to some world of what I would call being perpetually hybrid. You know, having people maybe in the office sometimes, having people in disparate locations sometimes. I, I think one of the things we're going to have to have re, you know re, readdress is what does that sort of clean desk strategy look like? Uh, I'm not going to shine the the video all over my desk, but my desk is the antithesis of a clean desk, secure worksite strategy uh, at the moment. So uh, I'm not following what I'm preaching, but I, I think that we're going to need to look at you know the whole of the employee, not just the you know what are we clicking on, what are we doing from a digital standpoint. There's there's certainly the physical aspect, regardless of whether you're on site or not, it's going to be a huge one. Right. Yeah, and that goes and, back and, to culture. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Go ahead, one please. of the terms you used was clean desk, which is a well, I have it's more than that. But the point in that term that I want to bring out is it's we all know what you mean when some when somebody says clean desk. If I say, well, we're talking about OPSEC, people are going to go up oh, what they're not. So it's relatable. I mean, that's you keep coming back to that, which is really to me important. And I think yeah. because of the hybrid model, our, our, we're going to have to figure out how to encapsulate what I would call OPSEC in understandable terms for wherever the heck you happen to be working, you've got to be aware of some things. Or am, am I even close there? No, I, I think you make a great point because we're going to have to come up with a shared vocabulary and a shared vernacular. That's part of, if you really break down and uh, MIT, uh, uh, the MIT cybersecurity team has done a really good top, uh, job of uh, laying out their MIT cybersecurity culture model. And they talk about things like values, attitudes, and beliefs of the organization. And I think wrapped up in there is this no, uh, this notion of a vocabulary. You're going to have to have a vocabulary that may be something that, that's known across the industry, but uh, I, I figured somebody would pick up on the clean desk comment. <laughs> but, but you're going to have to have certain vocabulary words that might be semi-universal, but might have a contextualized meaning for your specific organization. So a clean desk strategy for uh, the Pentagon is going to be a lot different than a clean desk strategy for uh, you know, 3M, a company who makes post-it notes, who is is like the uh, antithesis of uh, a clean desk uh, company. It is a great password manager, though. It is, uh, you know, I. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but um, no, nah, I'm j I'm joking. There was nothing on that post-it note. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it is. But to your point, though, I, I think there is something there that that you're going to people are going to need to think about what is this vernacular? What is this vocabulary that we develop that means something to our users? And, and that's why I, I sort of bagged on a little bit of the security awareness month and sort of the, hey, it's October, let's start spamming people with 
you know, reasons they should care about cybersecurity. This should be something that's ingrained in the culture that you constantly care about. You're constantly thinking about, do I have post-it notes with passwords on my desk? Uh, am I leaving out stuff that is sensitive, uh, e even in my home, when let's say my neighbor who works next door to me works for a competitor? Uh, is that something I really want to leave in my my office that's right next to my foyer that they could look over and see? It, it's those kinds of things that we've got to think about. You've got to ingratiate that and build that into your culture. Otherwise, you know, clicking next, next, and finish on a couple of security awareness CBT modules isn't going to help you. Well, I also think this is one of those areas where we we kind of struggle because it, it seems like people tend not to focus on the things that have been around for a long time or that are considered. Uh, I've been using the term sexy, right? Insecurity. And so yeah. shiny it's, toy it's not syndrome. high speed, low drag. It's kind of takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of work. Um, it's, you know, something everybody's dealt with and everybody wants to work on the newest thing. And if we really pivot to this, I, I think you kind of address this in a couple different ways, maybe not directly, but like culture is really the most important thing to a security program. And if you don't get that right, everything else is just so much harder. So, I mean, what, any any thoughts with regard to that? Yeah, it's funny. So I, I spent my weekend, uh, my wife and I building a retaining wall on our side yard. And it was hilarious because the biggest argument we had was about how deep was the trench and how much foundation of, of gravel, uh, of pea gravel and sand did we need. And, and it comes back to that point of, uh, okay, you know, where does that foundation sit? Does that foundation sit on, hey, we've got this platform for security awareness that we bought from you know, vendor, whoever, whether it's, you know, us at Proofpoint or one of our competitors, it's great that you have a platform to manage it, but that's not the starting point. The starting point is not just buy stuff, not just buy technology. The starting point is to actually build out a culture, build out a plan, build out what you want, your, how you want to change behavior and, and positively impact culture in, in your organization before you start trying to throw vendors and technology at the problem. That's, that's not, you know, everybody sort of leaps to, uh, like you said, the, the sexy out there, the shiny toy syndrome, as I call it, uh, you know, quit trying to buy products, quit trying to buy products and CapEx your way out of problems. That's sort of the easy way uh, to, to do it. The hard way is to really think about the problem and build a real program and build an ecosystem in your own world that makes sense to you. And that ecosystem might be Hey, what do we need to do to contextualize training? Do we need to, uh, you know, conscript some employee volunteers to do short videos of our own and and hang up posters and make this relevant and you know do things like build a glossary of terms? Uh, it, it's funny. I spent a lot of my career at Gartner uh, doing things like reviewing security policies, for instance. I mean, talk about mind-numbingly boring stuff at times. But one of the faults that I would find with a lot of people is. Have you ever thought about putting a glossary of terms together or, or a statement of terms? You use all these acronyms in your policies and your procedures and your guidelines. Does anybody know what those acronyms really mean? Is there a centralized source of truth? And I think that's one of the big things that's missing in security awareness is people go about you know talking to different vendors and looking for you know the, these great CBT modules that are, are universal, but it's not contextualizing. It's not making them relevant. Again, if you, I go back to my point earlier, if you don't have that shared empathy uh, when when you're trying to teach somebody something, they're never going to learn it. And, and culture has nothing to do with products. It's all about the executive, the leadership team deciding that they want a, a, a culture of security in the organization. And, and if you can't get that buy-in, I mean, no matter what you buy or deploy, it's not going to have the same effect. To your point, that foundation's not there. Yeah, yeah, it's hilarious. I mean, look at, uh, I mean, look at companies who have had things like the worst things in security happen to them: ransomware incidents, insider data theft, breaches, those sorts of things. And all of those are not preventable events. Uh, it's what really bears out to me when I look at the culture of a company. What bears out is is how do you how do you recover from that? How do you, you know, build? It, it, it sounds like a, a campaign slogan, but thinking about like building back better and, and building it the right way uh, the next time around. How do how do we learn from from the mistakes that we've made and move forward? I, I spent a lot of my time going through incident response investigations the last half decade, and it's amazing how many people write an IR plan and throw it on the shelf and never look at it. 
It's, <laughs> and then when you have an incident, uh, the, the last thing that you do is actually go to your IR playbooks and start following them. A lot of it just ends up being this, this spew of chaos until you ultimately call somebody in to, to clean up the problem. It's about learning from the mistakes and, and incrementally getting better. You're not going to snap your fingers and be perfect the next time. Same thing is true with security awareness. You can have the best you know, program in the world, you can have the, you could spend your money on the best content, the best modules out there. You're still going to have people that ultimately don't do what you're trying to get them to do. Yeah. Brian, thank you so much for joining us on Business Security Weekly. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. To learn more about Proofpoint or how to solve your security and awareness challenges, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash Proofpoint. We're going to take a quick break and then cover the leadership and communications articles for this week. <laughs>